perhaps the perfect image to reflect that very English music by the composer Vaughan Williams uh, is this very English scene looking out over very English countryside. Uh, for anybody who's grown up in this country, these are very familiar images indeed. Uh, the site of a church, an ancient medieval church, surrounded uh, by very old trees, uh, perhaps a farmstead nearby, perhaps a little village huddling around, uh, around the church itself. Um, these wonderful ancient buildings dappled with sunlight, uh, their walls covered with lichen and in their uh, graveyards and surrounded by the graves and the tombstones of the locals. But how is it that we make sense of these buildings? How do we try to understand these complex buildings which sit in our landscape looking harmonious and very much at one and unified within uh, the familiar scenes, and yet which were built over a long period of time, often in different styles uh, and with parts of them being replaced by later designs, later styles, later fashions. Hello and welcome to another session of Lockdown Learning with me, Paul Holland. Uh, today we're talking about Gothic architecture, um, th that fantastic style that was developed in the late Middle Ages based on the pointed arch particularly. Um, today's session is concentrating uh, specifically on English styles, uh, partly to look at not so much how different it is from the other styles, the French and the German and the Spanish, but specifically to look at how in England, there were three different stages, three different styles that developed and how we can recognise them from each other. They're very distinct um, and they're very English as well. Gothic is the period of architecture, probably the first period of architecture in history where we really have a distinctive difference between the nations. There's, there's definitely a, a German, a definitely a French Gothic style, there's definitely that's different from the Spanish, from the Italian, and England particularly developed its own insular forms, its own particular um, varieties and characteristics, but it does fall into three very distinct stages. And not only is this lovely to be able to recognise when you're out and about and you can spot the different stages, they're very, very distinctive, they're very easy to recognise. Um, it also means, once you get quite good at this, that you can date a building, or at least a part of a building, often to within about 50 years of its actual time of construction, which is, which is quite a nice thing to be able to do as you're out and about. So let's have a look at how this whole style developed. Uh, we're going to take it right the way back to Norman architecture, because there's plenty of churches in this country where we can still spot Norman. Here it is. Uh, this is the style which on the continent is called Romanesque and uh, it is absolutely dominated by the round arch. And it's at this point really that it's worth mentioning that um, most of what we'll be looking at today in this session is based on the arch and therefore the window and the doorway because that's the real key way of identifying a particular style from English architecture uh, from the from the Middle Ages. And um, so uh, although there's a few other little bits and pieces that you can look at, and we look at that uh, towards the um, end, uh, it's, it's the arch and the shape of the arch and the window in particular uh, that we'll be concentrating on. It's worth me also mentioning that we will be mainly looking at ecclesiastical architecture. So it's churches, it's cathedrals, uh, why is that? They're the only things that survived. Uh, the poor people of the period lived in very flimsy houses uh, made of wood or wattle and daub. Um, they certainly haven't come down to us. Uh, the rich lived in their castles. Uh, they probably, um, they're not only are they often quite ruined nowadays, um, they just didn't get as much attention lavished on them as the churches. Perhaps because of the religious fervour of that period, it's the churches that were given the most attention and therefore uh, it's to those that we look for the finest of the architecture from this period. So let's have a look again at that round arch, that semicircular arch that the Normans brought across with them um, when they came in the 11th century. This is why we call it Norman architecture, not Romanesque. Um, the arch has been in use since Roman times. Uh, it's made with a single point if you have your pair of compasses and it forms a semicircle. It's as simple as that. And you can see 
from this particular photo, this is the outside of the building that we saw before, um, and you can see the basic structure of it is made up of round arches. As you can see, uh, they've been filled in, and the ones at the bottom have had extra new, sort of later windows um, inserted into them, but the basic structure of this building is Norman, and you can see that from the round arches. And in fact, not all buildings survived intact from this period, uh, but little bits do survive. So sometimes you'll walk into a church and you'll notice that the entrance hasn't been replaced with the latest Gothic. It, it was kept in place and therefore uh, you can identify it as Norman from this period. Uh, and particularly if the stonework is old and looks really quite weathered, and if it has these dog tooth patterns and zigzag patterns um, around the top, then that identifies it as Norman, um, even if it's just a little uh, doorway set into um, the wall uh, of a church, then you are standing in front of something that is um, just under 1,000 years old. They become quite elaborate as the centuries progress. Uh, this one's in Malmesbury, and, and it's a very fine example of a, of a, of a Norman doorway. And as you, as you look more closely, you can see, as, as well as the geometric and zigzag patterns, uh, you've got lots of very elegant swirling designs and lots of sculpture um, based on the Holy Scripture. So now we come to Gothic, which began in the 13th century. Um, Lots of people still not quite sure why it started. Some people think that the Crusaders, having visited the Holy Land, brought back the idea of the pointed arch. Uh, the pointed arch is just generally um, much more flexible. Um, you can have wide ones and you can have narrow ones, so that makes it a much more flexible um, element of design. So here on this diagram you can see that the um, Norman vault is unfortunately restricted by the fact that it's a semicircle and the semicircle always has to be the same height whereas a gothic vault using the pointed arch can vault um, it can span across wider and much more narrow spaces uh, making it much much more flexible and it's based on the two-point arch in other words you're using your pair of compasses now twice to make two separate arches which intersect like this So whatever the origins of the pointed arch and when it arrived in Europe, it must have looked really quite new, quite jagged and jarring. Um, it caught on very quickly and was very, very swiftly um, adopted throughout the church building of the time. So in England, we tend to divide our Gothic period into three distinct periods. Um, this was begun by the early 19th century architect Thomas Rickman, uh, since then, people have tried to change the system. Some people say it doesn't quite work. Actually, on the whole, it works quite nicely. And that is because you have early English taken up the 13th century, then decorated in the 14th century, and perpendicular in the 15th century. Early English tends to be very simple, very plain, um, quite elegant, but ordered. Uh, there tends to be little decoration, and it tends to be quite two-dimensional. Decorated is much more flamboyant. It's much more interested in uh, complexity and curves and shapes and geometrical design. And finally, perpendicular, which is really very uniquely English. Um, the other two previous styles, you can see their equivalents on the continent uh, in the French um, rayonnant style and the flamboyant style, but perpendicular is, is very distinctively English. Uh, it doesn't exist at all on the continent. It's based on much more use of horizontals along with verticals to create panelling um, and also the use of a flat arch or a four-point arch, which, which we'll look at when we get to it. So let's have a look at some examples of the beginnings of early English. Um, this first picture is a little bit of a fake. Uh, it's, it's basically... The locals have decided that they wanted to replace their Norman arch with a pointed arch. Uh, so they've, they've taken apart the old Norman arch, which you can see is Norman from the zigzag patterns. And they've cut it in two and they've put it together to make a pointed arch much, much more fashionable, which is, which is good fun. And you see that in a few churches around uh, the country where they've reused the Norman materials. But by the time we reach the, 
the, the height of Gothic. This is uh, a picture from the town of Stamford. This is St. Mary's in that town. This is a very fine town church. And you can see the architects really playing with the new pointed arch um, all the way up the walls there of the tower, sometimes using circles, sometimes using um, extra sort of cusps at the very top there of the photo. Um, all of those on, on, the, on the left face of the tower are blind arches. They don't have windows behind them. So you can see the architects using these designs now purely for embellishment and for decoration. And if you look at the tower from a distance, uh, here it is, you can see a very unified, very beautiful composition uh, leading up to those three windows at the top of the tower with their lancet arches. So what we tend to find in uh, early English architecture is a repetition of the lancet arch, and that means those very tall, thin, single arches. Okay, We saw them on the side of the tower. You can see them going all the way up the front of the tower. Um, when you go into the countryside and you find smaller village churches that couldn't afford uh, such complex architecture, you can still identify this as early English. Look at the windows. They are single uh, lancet windows, uh, very plain, um, nothing particular to distract your attention from the, the simplicity and the elegance. Very often in early English, you see them grouped in threes, or even more, and this is the beginning of what we call tracery. So you have two or three or four lancet windows put together, and then you've got some space above which you, you add an extra uh, window or hole or a circle in, and then you can add more of those, and then suddenly you've ended up with one large window um, with lots of lights. Those vertical pieces of stone that separate the individual lancet windows are now called mullions, uh, and mullions are going to be one of the big features that you'll notice as we move towards the decorated style. So here's a lovely example of um, a decorated window uh, from the 14th century. This is in Western Burt School Chapel, and you'll notice if we look at it more closely that what started out as three individual windows has become one large window with beautiful complex tracery at the top. And because the tracery here is quite um, curvilinear, uh, there's lots of sort of flame shapes, lots of uh, swirling shapes, we can identify this as quite late decorated. So you can put this into the second half of the 14th century. So something from 1350 to 1380. So here are some more examples of decorated windows. Um, as you can see, they've all become much bigger now. Uh, they let much more light in, but the tracery has become much more complex, and it seems to just enjoy the sheer exuberance of making patterns and interlocking shapes and swirling forms. So this is Malmesbury, uh, which we saw earlier on. You can recognise, hopefully, the Norman entrance at the end of the path, uh, that huge semicircular arch. But if you look at the rest of the building, uh, most of the windows here show elements of the decorated style. And just looking at a few of them more closely, you can see that the architects are reveling in the complexity and the, and the, the playfulness, if you like, of, of the new style of architecture. And just to the side of the building, this is one of the main windows you can see um, a, a really fine example of decorated, late decorated, curvilinear style. Actually, the stuff at the bottom has those circles within circles. That's much more uh, geometric. That, that's a real feature from the early decorated period, so the beginning of the 14th century. Uh, but this, this architect has combined them beautifully with lots of other sort of complex patterns above them. So the whole thing forms a, a really superb unified whole and you can see endless variations on these patterns and this next example is quite interesting it, it shows uh, the transition from decorated to the last style the perpendicular on the right so there's a decorated window on the left uh, with a complex pattern inside the arch uh, but the one on the right is perpendicular so what makes the perpendicular style distinctive? Well, it uh, 
comes down to those vertical pieces of stone that I mentioned, those mullions. Uh, if you look at this window, which is a, a perfectly good example of uh, a simple village church perpendicular window, you'll notice that the mullions go right to the top. Uh, they're uninterrupted, more or less uninterrupted, uh, and in most perpendicular windows, uh, from the very bottom all the way up to the top of the arch. And the tracery is complex, uh, and it, it weaves in and out of those vertical mullions, but they're always there, and they provide, um, if you like, a, a sense of uniformity and stability that, that unifies the whole window. And it could be argued that because those mullions go right to the top, they bring a complete unity to the window. And, and that, that is in some ways quite satisfying. Some people find that the decorated style, although it's, it's wonderfully playful and, and fantastical with all of its curves and shapes, uh, in, in actual fact, uh, the exuberance becomes almost overbearing. Whereas in the perpendicular style, there's, there's a wonderful sense of, of unity and uniformity, uh, which you'll see in some of the examples that we come up with next. Um, they also tend to let a lot more light in. And one of the reasons for this is that the perpendicular style begins to develop something called the four-point arch. So here's the four-point arch. And as you can see now, although it's still pointed, uh, it's much more shallow. So it has two very tight arcs at the corners, at the, at the spring of the arch, if you like, at the bottom where it springs from the verticals. And then the the whole thing is finished off with two much more shallow arcs. Now these much more shallow arches are really suited to perpendicular. Uh, if you look at this church, you'll see that um, the perpendicular style is, is actually quite interested in the horizontals. We've not just got mullions now going vertically up the windows, we've actually got these transoms going horizontally across as well. And we'll increasingly find that in perpendicular architecture. And because there's this emphasis on the horizontal, and because these transoms and mullions create, if you like, panels, square, rectangular panels, then we increasingly see uh, much more of a sort of square shape, rectangular shape, within the patterns of perpendicular architecture. And that's probably why it's called perpendicular as well. So if we look at a few examples of perpendicular churches now, um, you'll be able to see exactly what I'm talking about. The mullions going right to the top of the windows uh, of the um, arches and the arches being quite wide, uh, still quite varied. Uh, there was a, a lot of discussion in, I think, the Victorian times or the early 20th century um, uh, in which critics said that the perpendicular was very boring. It was very um, mass manufactured, if you like, uh, for that period. Uh, but actually, I find there's a huge amount of variety. Just look at the arches on the right-hand side of the picture, for example. They're, they are now back to two-point arches, uh, but they come to corners instead of round springs. So they're segmented arches, uh, but they're still Gothic. Uh, they've still got uh, a huge amount of character to them. Here's an example from the north of England. This is Cartmel Priory. Just look at the size of that huge perpendicular window on the left. But it's equally suited to the small window in the middle there, which is again a segmented arch. I don't think that's even uh, a two-point arch. I think that's a single-point arch. So there's a lot of inventiveness in the perpendicular period, which I think people often overlook. And you can also see, can't you, on that left-hand picture, a huge horizontal line, a transom, which just breaks up the amount of glass and somehow softens the whole effect in a way that, that just suits the English temperament of uh, restraint. Uh, we tend not to go for m dramatic, soaring verticals like they do on the continent. We, we tend to, to try to temper that a little bit with uh, a lot more horizontals. You don't just find the perpendicular windows um, in the large projects, the big cathedrals and churches, you find them all across the country. Uh, most little parish churches had uh, new windows fitted in the latest perpendicular style. And that's why, in a way, this is probably the most familiar for you um, as you wander around the villages of England. And very often they were inserted into much older buildings, which I think we've already seen, haven't we, in Binham Priory here in Norfolk. Uh, 
where although the structure is Norman, they've inserted new windows. The interiors of these churches are also very often light and airy, particularly those ones built in Norfolk and the West Country, the, the Cotswolds. These are often called wool churches. They were built with the money made from wool in the Middle Ages, a huge sheep producing um, areas and, and wool was exported all across Europe and the money was used to build these fantastic town churches which as you can see let a huge amount of light in uh, there's more glass than stone really and the windows at the back again massive uh, windows very flat arches letting as much light in as possible there's also in the perpendicular style a, a real interest in mouldings again these are very much emphasizing the horizontal this is very typical of um, the perpendicular style so you have a lot of uh, elements running around a church and around the windows and you've also got a lot more um, panelling and in some parts of the country like in the east where they use flint this panelling uh, is, is wonderfully um, executed in two dimensions you can see it on the left there the mixture of stone and flint and then all the way along the bottom the base of the, of the, of the church you've got this, this panelling which echoes the panelling of the windows as well and they also enjoy using battlements, uh, the no military purpose at all, but you see in this period a lot more use of um, battlements or embrasures. I think this is quite a good picture to show how Gothic architecture works really well in terms of having different size arches and different forms of arches and even sitting at slightly different heights, but somehow working well together and forming a, a really unified uh, composition. And those wider, flatter arches that we see in perpendicular uh, reach their, their final expression, if you like, in these square windows, which effectively are still perpendicular. They're very late perpendicular. Don't forget that the perpendicular style goes right through beyond the 15th century into the Tudor period. And for that reason, it's not just the 15th century, it's into the 16th century, at the time that the Italians and the French were rediscovering the delights of the Greek and the Roman styles of architecture in the Renaissance, the English were still producing these wonderful works of late Gothic architecture. You've probably spotted in a couple of the pictures that I've put up uh, how the perpendicular style seems to enjoy making a feature of the tower. There's some stunning, spectacular examples uh, around the country, particularly recommend uh, the Somerset Towers uh, anywhere towards the west of Wiltshire and into Gloucestershire and all the way down towards the West Country. You've got a superb collection of hundreds and hundreds of, of perpendicular towers, which again seem to make a real feature of this panelling. So the panelling that you can see in the big windows there uh, is echoed in the panelling of the stonework all around the tower. One of my favourite churches is in, in North Norfolk. This is Terrington, St Clement, and it, it just it just forms such a, a wonderful unity, uh, despite the fact that there are so many variants and and uh, different forms within this particular building. And there's a, just a glimpse that you can see of a massive east window there on the right hand side, huge perpendicular thing letting the light in. But the light, if you think about it, is coming from every single direction including above the nave where it meets the chancel if you can see right in the middle of the picture at the top you can see another huge window which actually you can't really appreciate until you're inside the church just finishing here with a picture of Gloucester Cathedral from the cloisters in which you can see a huge amount of perpendicular reworking of an originally Norman cathedral. Uh, there's lots of hints of that. If you look at the tops of those pinnacles um, on the left, you can see some Norman or transitional early English elements, and you can see a Norman chapter house on the left with the semicircular arches. But then the rest of the, the building has had these huge windows inserted, all of them uh, wonderfully perpendicular. And the tower as well is uh, a fine example of a perpendicular Gothic tower.
Something else you might want to consider uh, when you walk inside the church is uh, the roof. Uh, many early churches, even a lot of later churches, just kept it very simple uh, with a wooden roof, um, sometimes embellishing them with uh, hammer beam elements and, and, as you can just see there, some angels resting on the top of the uh, individual hammer beams. Uh, so this is very typical of an English church. A wooden roof is lighter, uh, it's cheaper, uh, but they do burn down given that candles were used inside. So, um, so very often the roofs were replaced with stone vaults and increasingly in English architecture, possibly because we weren't uh, building as high as in France and Germany, uh, therefore you can see the details more possibly, we began to really embellish our vaults. Uh, we put lots of lovely little details on. We added extra ribs so that you didn't just have the basic vault, but you have these extra ribs uh, linking them and interlinking. These are called Leon vaults, and the English are particularly famous for them, and they arrive in the decorated period primarily, so from the, from the 14th century onwards, and they become increasingly complicated until you reach a uh, wonderful... Uh, Leon vaulting that you can see here in the nave of Norwich Cathedral and then finally just to finish it off um, obviously the final expression of this is in the perpendicular style uh, with fan vaulting because they look like fans and here's an example or two um, still using the panel if you like as the basic element so it's a kind of modular system of paneling all the way down Good. That's English Gothic architecture, uh, hopefully explained in a way that means whenever you come across a church uh, in town or country, you'll be able to uh, identify which bits are from which period. Uh, just a word of warning, quite a lot of uh, churches were remodelled during the Victorian times. Uh, this often results in them actually having quite sort of Victorian forms of what you've just been studying here with me. Um, and obviously quite a lot of Victorian churches were built from scratch, especially for the big cities with their growing populations during the Victorian period, the 19th century with uh, growing urbanization. So it's always worth spotting uh, the nature of the stonework. Does it look does it look actually machine cut? Does it look too perfect? Um, if it is, it's probably Victorian. Uh, but the Victorians generally, especially the good architects, were designing their churches based on specific styles from the Gothic period. So you can still identify the style, even if you've got to be a little bit wary uh, that it's not actually as old as you thought it was when you first glimpsed it from a distance. Good. I hope that was interesting. Um, I hope you are... Um, Confident in reading your church architecture now, in England at least. Uh, if you enjoyed it, please subscribe. And um, I look forward to seeing you in another session of Lockdown Learning. Check out what else is on my playlist for art history and a number of other bits and pieces. Thank you. Goodbye. Mm -hmm.